our Brown Girls Community Talk Show. I'm Wendy O'Connell, and I am here today, very luckily, with Annette Spaulding. Many of you know Annette. She's a certified master scuba diver, and she's an underwater archaeologist. She's also on underwater search and rescue teams, and she brings her unbridled enthusiasm for discovery to others through her lively presentations and talks. Over the course of over 35 years, Annette has discovered hundreds, hundreds of submerged historical sites and artifacts. Most recently, the quote, Indian Rock here in Brattleboro, the petroglyphs, um, they're right in town, right where the West River meets the Connecticut, which is an Abenaki sacred site. Welcome, Annette. Thank you. You've done so many things and have had, have had so many discoveries over the course of your career, so we're going to talk about some of them. What was your first, the first thing that really compelled you to jump in the water and dive deep? Well, I guess it would have to be, um, I was fortunate enough um, to grow up in a, a little town down uh, in Massachusetts, and there was um, a private boys school, boys school at that time called St. Mark's School for Boys, and my grandfather was a caretaker of the boathouse where they had their boat um, equipment, scuba diving and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so as a child, I had unlimited use to the water um, at this Fort Meadow. And I used to hold my breath with my little mask and snorkel and go further and further. But I, I always saw things that were just a little bit deeper that I could hold my breath to get to. Uh -huh. Well, I didn't realize it, but I was actually diving down to 20, 23 feet. Um, and I really didn't know how far because I didn't have a gauge or whatever, but I, I would hold my breath and I learned on Sea Hunt. I used to watch Sea Hunt with my father and that that really got me going too. So um, actually I learned how to equalize from Sea Hunt where you would actually blow, you know, almost like you were blowing your nose so you could keep your station tubes open so it would allow you with the pressure to go deeper. And what was funny, and the reason why I brought that up is because as a child learning that, I was able to go deeper and deeper. And then they were teaching um, classes. Um, St. Mark's had instructors teaching people how to scuba dive. Huh. And I would listen in over and over and over. Of course, I was a girl, not a boy, but I would sit back and kind of listen in. And then one day, um, I did have... Um, the opportunity to try scuba and my grandfather I told I said Pepe I want to be an underwater archaeologist and you know as I got older and he said well that's great I like your exploration you know that's great and your enthusiasm however you really can't make very much money in the future being an archaeologist there's not really that many people that are hired you know maybe a state job or something and they don't really make that much as a state employee or whatever yeah. And um, I had a very strong interest also and was very good in business mm -hmm. and um, income tax law because I worked for an income tax firm at the age of 15, 16, 17, 18, and I had a great boss who paid for me to start tax classes. I go to school, work after school, take those tax classes um, in the evening, and then had an associate's degree and uh, graduated at the same time from high school, and he was so wonderful. But I did do what my grandfather um, thought was best, and I became um, very, very good at the tax law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But my passion yeah. is exploration and diving, and I love discovery, and I love, I really love exploration. I do. Yes. It's in my heart, right here. Yeah. <laughs> when you were in middle school, you had kind of a foundational experience with that as well. I did. I have two younger sisters. I'm the oldest. No brothers. That's probably good because my father taught me how to fish and do all these things that, yeah. you know, spent a lot of time with me on the water, right. ice fishing, whatever. This was something I'll never forget. When I was young, it was middle school, we were getting ready for the long break, you know, that you would have for Christmas and New Year's. And what happened was um, that particular day, we had a program where a um, fireman came in and a person that does um, that's on the underwater rescue team. So here I am, this young person, and I love diving and I love exploration. I hate fire. I'm petrified of fire. Oh, huh. I could never be a fireman. Interesting, yeah. Probably because of this incident, I don't know. So anyway, they were talking to us, um, you know, what to do if anyone, you know, while you're on vacation, if you're on candles, you're on gas, whatever, you know, what to do if anybody ever caught on fire, always remember, stop, drop, roll. I mean, this was embedded in my head, stop, drop, roll. From this one very amazing, enthusiastic fireman. Mm -hmm. 
the next one was the person that was a diver and they were talking about okay like people like to go out on the ice and go ice skating sledding whatever fishing mm -hmm. and if you ever fall through the ice you always make sure you spread your weight and you do and um, if you if it cracks and then you yell for help but you have to be in control and you have to yell at the person that you that's coming to help you and tell them to lay down not to come any closer to you because if they do you're all gonna die you're all gonna go under so you yell at them and you tell them to lay down and distribute their weight and grab your feet so this was really in my head because these two people were so enthusiastic mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the site needless to say we go you know we're on school vacation I used to always go ice fishing with my father I loved it the little you know fishing tilts tip yes. ups would go up and my sister and I would be out there ice skating and we take turns getting the fish or sometimes you know whoever got there first got to pull it up and then my grandfather had this little camp a little tiny camp not even as big as this room, it's very small. Anyway, my dad had gone in to change some like, clothes or something, and he wasn't with us, he was always, always with us. But he went to the shore to go in to mm -hmm. change quick. While he was there, my sister Janet went through the ice. Um, and all that came into my head instantly, seeing her little bob down, back up, and holding on to ice, all that came into my head instantly was exactly what happened with that man. And what he told me and what he told all of us about yell for help, lay down, distribute your weight, yeah. and try to help that yeah. way. Well, my father heard us, and he came running, and he grabbed my ankles. And my dad and I were talking about this not too long ago before he passed away this past year. And he, he was coming right toward us, just like that man said. And I yelled at my father for the first time ever. And my father was in the military. It was weird for me to do this. And I said, Dad, stop. You're going to kill us all. We're going to all jump. Lay down. Grammy, you know, given him these directions, right? And he did. And so we, I was able to hold on to my sister's hands and, and my dad was able to show me back and we got, my, my sister was wow. fine. Wow. And she wasn't even in the water that long. But what I failed to tell you is the first incident that happened the same vacation before the underwater one was my grandmother, um, my father's mother um, and father used to have us over for dinner and we would have these elegant, you know, candles and all this, these dishes. And my sister had long hair and I had long hair and um, longer than mine is right now and hers too. So she was leaning over um, to put the silverware down or something and her hair caught on fire from the candle. That was the first thing that happened. And what came to my mind immediately, stop, drop and roll. They're gonna run, they're gonna run, grab them, stop them from running or it'll be worse. And I used that. Unbelievable. And those two men It's really amazing it was, what can happen, you know, yeah. like a vacation like that. So, um, yes, and then my sister also caught it on fire um, with the gas stove, oh, you know, geez. because we turned it on and it wouldn't start, and she left it on, and then we shut it, and then we it went, you know, and so her hair, the again, same sister. singed, yep, singed. Maybe that's why I'm afraid of fire. But anyway. Yeah, um, but that all happened in yes. the vacation yeah. right after you had yeah. had this training. It's that's amazing. You started scuba diving, and did you were trained for that? You, yes. You were trained for search and rescue too. Yes. 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 I got certified, and when I moved to Vermont, I immediately started taking classes. I wasn't. I was not on a rescue team before I came to Vermont, mm -hmm. but immediately once I got here, I applied. I was the first one I was on was the Meadowood Meadowood Underwater Rescue Team uh -huh. out of um, near Fitzwilliam. They had a great uh -huh. training center there. Uh huh. And um, there's what water is there? Um, well, they have a little pond, but we would train, we would do training, you know, classwork and everything, but then go to bodies of water. Uh-huh. Spofford Lake. Interesting, yes. The river. With, with the search and rescue, you still do training. You no, still uh, meet meet together to train? Oh, yes. I, I don't do, yes. We meet together and do training. I thought, I had my instructors, but I gave it up a long time ago because I am an explorer, and I could not devote the time to teaching others to dive. I feel bad about that, but I couldn't because I wanted to be out exploring right. and finding. Yes. But I continue, yes, um, absolutely. We train um, two times a week. I mean, two times a month we're actually together. In the course of, of your career, this ongoing career of yours, you've retrieved train wrecks, forts, bridges, safes, steamboat, and you've 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 also dived with the great white sharks. Yes. Right? So I was honored to be invited to go to Stan Waterman. He's a very famous underwater um, photographer. I actually worked with him on the movie The Deep when I was 18 years old. Oh. But I, you don't see me in the movie because all I do is 
release all these morphine ampules that were on the shipwreck um, and they're floating through the water and I just had to keep taking them out of the wreck and taking them out of the wreck. But <laughs> I loved it because I get to see everything and meet Jacqueline Bissett, Nick Nolte, Jacqueline's wonderful woman, huh. and work with Stan. But anyway, back to Stan um, and the Great White Sharks. Yeah. On his 90th birthday, I got invited to go off the coast of California where he and Jacques Cousteau as children, I'm not children, but younger people, yeah. Jacques Cousteau was his best friend, uh -huh. and they discovered where the great white sharks would go uh -huh. to, to breed. It takes 11 months for them to have babies. Anyway, I had the opportunity to dive with Stan Waterman at 90 years old. Wow. Underwater videotaping. We saw 16 great white sharks, anywhere from 16 to 21 feet long, and I was with Stan. And um, it was very inspirational to be with him, seeing the sharks that he discovered with Jacques Cousteau uh, years ago. Uh, so that was another discovery. That kind of brings us to um, what you have explored and retrieved in Brattleboro. Let's hear a little bit about how you got involved with the rock carvings, with the petroglyphs. Yes. I love diving in Brattleboro. <coughs> Excuse me. Talking too fast with excitement. <laughs> so anyway. Um, Brattleboro is an awesome place um, that, of history. So is the Bellas Falls and walking in. So is in every place, actually. Um, so what happened was um, Giovanna Peebles, um, she's an archaeologist, and she her, um, her background is Native American archaeology. And then there were two other amateur archaeologists um, here from Brattleboro, and they were doing a research project on um, Fort Dummer. So I was involved with that back in the 70s with them. And I went to the library, probably in the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, but early 80s. And I was doing this research in, on Fort Dummer. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of the file, there was a sketch of this rock called Indian Rock. And I'm thinking, what is this doing in the middle of this file on Fort Dummer? Dummer, yeah. Anyway, needless to say, I have found shipwrecks. I have found all these things that you just mentioned and many, many other things. I have never ever found Native American petroglyphs. Oh. But there was something about that drawing, mm -hmm. and I didn't know at the time who this boy was. He was 10 years old, and he did this drawing when he was with his dad, walking down by the river and looking at it. And so later, I, I really paying attention to who did this drawing. It was Lock and Mead. And Lock and Mead, like, how do I know Lock and Mead? He's one of the most famous sculptures That's in right. the United States. That's and right. he did this drawing at 10 years old. Amazing. But I, I found that out later. But I'm looking at it and I thought, I want to find this. I want to rediscover this because now it's underwater. Since 1909, mm. when they put the dam in, the water was only supposed to go up five feet. It went up 15 plus. That was the Vernon Dam. Vernon yes, Dam. Right. Mm -hmm. Underwater. The Brattleboro Cheap Meadows right now where people are kayaking. Yeah. It's the, that used to be an airfield and a park. Right. And where I was looking for this, this, this site, Indian Rock, was above the water and it just went down suddenly and so everybody just had a rough idea where it was but not exact idea. Well I didn't think it was gonna be this hard to find but <laughs> I was intrigued and I was determined to find to rediscover yes. this. Yes. And it took 30 years off and on but the last two years before I found it I try to dedicate 90% of my diving except for my rescue team and some other projects to this. Mm -hmm. I did 167 dives the year before I found it, and I did, I think, 169 the year I found it. Wow. And um, it was unbelievable because all my friends, diving friends, kept making fun of me, and they kept saying, you're never going to find it. Because a few of them did come with me. I asked to come to help me look because I had a regular search pattern going, and I'd have to get, you know, through silt and sand or whatever. I found this eight inches under the sand. But before I did, wow. I had an incredible, incredible discovery and a very spiritual, um, I don't know how to explain this. I am not Native American. I'm mostly Swedish. But there's something about this. I've dove all over the world. I've been to 43 countries, 149 islands, and I'm not really sure which country they belong to. Um, and I have found all kinds of things. And you always love being underwater. It's very, it is kind of spiritual in itself, but there's something about this place. When I got into this cove area and coming down the confluence and just thinking about everything, I have to say, the fish were always right with me, the same ones that come, and I had names for them, and bass and everything, and the lamprey eels, and the baby lamprey eels, and through these different stages, but always looking and searching, and I started getting very discouraged um, because I hadn't found anything. Mm. But this one day, 
one day, just as the as the sun was going down, I'm all by myself. I have my GoPro almost out of battery. I'm almost out of air. It's supposed to come up at 500 feet. I was down to 200. I mean, not 500 feet. 500 pounds of yeah. air. You start with 3,000. I was down to 200, oh. but I was shallow, and I knew I could come to. The, but these three things: sun's going down, almost dark. GoPro almost dead. Tank 200 pounds. All of a sudden, I made this one swipe, and I saw this beautiful, beautiful onyx, white, um, I mean quartz, white mm -hmm. quartz line. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, if I was going to do something, I would do it here. My next swipe, I was this close to it. It was 10 inches around, and it was a petroglyph face, just like the ones in Bellas Falls. Uh. And I wasn't looking for that. I was looking for Indian rock. Right. But I found this instead. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I had tears in my eyes. My eyes were salty underwater and I was crying. Yeah. I, was, I was so, so excited. I couldn't believe I found yeah. this. And I got one shot of it and my battery died. <sighs> the sun went down. The shot was just enough. The sun was shining right on it. The way it was, it amazing. was amazing. And I came up with 100, 100 pounds of air. That is a no-no. Yeah. I'm mad at myself, but I knew I was in shallow water. Anyway, um, that's what happened. And then I was so inspired and I kept looking and then I found the next year, Indian Rock. Uh-huh. And, and I how, was, how far away was that from? Not far, mm -hmm. um, not far at all. Um, probably 75 feet. I was just swiping and taking some of the silt off. We never knew if it was on an individual rock right. or a ledge. Right. It's on a ledge. Yeah. And that ledge, unfortunately, is in an angle like this. And in time, after the dam went in, it filled up yeah. with lots of silt. And right. I found it eight inches under silt. Unbelievable. I have well, goosebumps again. <laughs> I think I think that what the things you've done have given you many goosebumps. There are just so many um, synchronicities that have happened for you and all kinds of um, uh, all kinds of things that co are coincidental. This discovery of Indian rock, as it is called, um, is known to be one of the most significant petroglyph sites in North America. Huge discovery. And you also have worked pretty closely with Atawi in, in town, Rich Holshu, who has done so much to uh, bring all of this information about um, our native culture to us. Um, and you're so much a part of that. Could you speak a little bit sure. to that? Um, so anyway, um, what happened was, when I was searching and um, somehow Rich found out that I was you know, looking for this and when I did discover it, um, Rich asked to meet me at the Brattleboro Marina and so we we're gonna have a business meeting about what I'm doing. So when I sat down with him, he looked right at me and he said, I wanna know what your intentions are for doing this very seriously. Mm. And um, I said, right from the bottom of my heart. Exactly what I told you, how I was so inspired by this and there's something about very spiritual about this place. And I wanted to be part of it even though I wasn't Native American. I wasn't doing this for any promotional thing. I don't even tell anyone I'm doing this really, the people, you know, because they just make fun of me. But anyway, so Rich and I, after that, got along just fine. Uh -huh. He really wanted to make sure this was something, I was doing it for the right reason. Yeah. And I was. Yeah. And, um, I do many presentations and the Native American people I met are great and they come up and they tell me that they are very happy with the respect that I have for their culture yeah. and for the history. Yes, yes. Yeah, and your connection to it is, is yes. such a strong connection. And also, you know, you, you have talked about how, you know, you've been down below the surface of the Connecticut River for years and years. That's over 30 years. How has the river changed for you in that time? Oh my gosh. So. Um, for, I've been on the underwater rescue team, as you know, for over 35 years. And when we f did a rescue and looking in the river for anyone, I'm not joking, we would have like three inch visibility. Mm. It was so bad. You had to, you know, even with light, sometimes it would reflect out. But now, oh my gosh, because I'm, I'm a volunteer um, for the Connecticut River Conservancy, um, which I just love so much and I got, I volunteered because I kept finding so many things and I was so impressed with things that didn't belong there that they made the arrangements to make sure they helped me get them out. Mm -hmm. And 
it's so nice and clean now. But now I have 20 to 30 foot visibility. Wow. It's so inspiring that something can change and reverse yeah. because so many people care and make it happen. That's incredible. Yeah. Also to be able to tell kids about that, about the oh, reversal. Oh, that's so important. Yeah. That's so important to me because all they hear about is negative, negative, everything's been discovered. And I have to say, 410 miles, you guys, guess what? You got 20 to 30 foot visibility, a total reversal because yeah. everyone cares, yeah. you can too. But the other thing, there is so much to be discovered, right. so much. And we have everything from Captain Kidd coming up from the ocean up the Connecticut River ah. to early traders, the Native American history, all of the history of these amazing bridges, the first elephant ever from North America crossing the Connecticut River from Putney to Westmoreland called the Elephant Bridge. I didn't know what that was until I found so it. So great. Oh my gosh, all these incredible things yeah. to be part of that. And I always say to them, there is so much more to find. And you don't even need to do it diving. You can do it on the shoreline to get the right. clues of what's there. But when you talk to kids, I know that you encourage girls a lot to I get do. involved with this. Absolutely. And given your own history, in a di very different time in history, oh, also, yes. that you were able to do it. It was a male-dominated sport, as you know. Um, and so over um, my life, I've had over 27 different certifications for various things in classes, archaeology, et cetera, and other things. But the, the sad thing is um, I've been, in my early career, male-dominated do male career, and many of them were very intimidating. Yeah. Um, I dove with FBI agents and other people that were, you know, really looked down upon me because I was a, a woman. But I, I had a great instructor, Mike Berry, down in Alexandria, Virginia. I can't say enough about him. He was so influential mm -hmm. in my decision to keep going. And this was a long time ago. And he said, Annette, you're an incredible diver, and that's why you're here. That's why I want you here. Uh -huh. And you know what? At the end of my classes, these people that were intimidating to me, they thanked me. I even saved one of their lives in the class who got tangled around in the rope from, that we were holding. So after that, he apologized to me in front of the other divers and said, I'll take her any day to dive with me. Uh-huh. There you go. That's such yes. that's a great story. Also, National Geographic tapped oh. you. I got a call from George Richardson in Winnipeg, Canada. George um, it was in his 80s, and his father is James A. Richardson. Very humble people, amazing. The multi-billion dollar airport, international airport in Canada is named after his dad. His dad bought this um, 12 of 44 of these airplanes. They were Fokker standard universal planes. There were none left except one in this remote area called Sharon Lake in the middle of nowhere. 78 expeditions looked for it. They called it the ghost of Sharon Lake. They couldn't find it. Huh. Mr. Richardson called me to go to Winnipeg. I met with him. He said, we need I need to have you. I've read a lot about you, heard a lot about you. You're determined and you don't give up. I said, that's me. As a matter of fact, on this big conference table, he said, I want you to be the leader and co or co-leader. You can have, you know, and put the team together uh -huh. to look for this. There's been 78 expeditions. Wow. And I put my, I went just like this on his desk. Like <laughs> I this cover, and they said, Mr. Richardson, we'll find it. Anyway, needless to say, um, many searches um, found it. You did. We found this plane, and it was 112 feet deep. Unfortunately, it was. Um, I was hoping it would be a lot, you know, not that deep in the middle of nowhere in a remote area that we had to fly to. We found it. Not only did we find it, we brought it up from the bottom, and um, it was an incredible recovery. And um, this took a number of years. And National Geographic contacted us, many other shows too. It was a big, big thing up there in Canada, mm -hmm. but also here. And so yes, National Geographic, it was on National Geographic when we were looking for it, when we discovered it, and when we brought it up. That's so exciting. That must have been wonderful. What, what year was that in that? Oh boy, oh my gosh, I've found hundreds of things since then. Um, this was in the early 2000s. Uh-huh. Oh my gosh. So probably 20 years ago. Yeah, about that. The stories uh, that you've told, um, th th that you told me recently, but also um, you've got some videos out. Uh, mm. People can, can look online and see some of the presentations that you've done. Um, I, I feel, you know, your strong, strong, strong determination, you know, whether it's a search mm -hmm. and rescue party or the petroglyphs or whatever. Um, but also, uh, you've had um, many coincidences. 
can you talk a little bit about what leads you? Uh, the, it sounds like the faith that you have in your own intuition. Well, I didn't think it was unusual at first, <laughs> but um, I'm very intuitive. I didn't realize how intuitive, but over the years, people look at me and they say, "Do you know what just happened with you?" And I said, "No." And the, then they would say, and, but it happens all the time, so it's not unusual. But when I'm underwater, it's especially, I'm yeah. very, very intuitive. Um, for instance, um, you know, looking for the petroglyph and just, just knowing I only had a couple minutes left and just, I wanted, I just felt in, that there was something there. Yeah. And I, you know, and the, the white, you know, quartz and then the neck, you know, but then I came out of the water and I didn't realize it at the time, but the people that worked at the marina restaurant kept telling me um, that night when I went in after finding this, and I was just so excited by myself, and I just went in and had a salad and celebrated, and they said, do you know that every time you're out there, wherever you are on the river out there, that there's eagles all the time that fly around over you, and that there were three in the tree? And I said, no, because when I come up and I've got all this equipment, I'm looking straight ahead or I'm looking at my boat, but I don't go like that. And I said, well, it happens all the time. So then I started, every now and then when I was on my boat, you know, kind of looking up, I had a 30-year-old pontoon boat that I, I got for this, for this expedition and I sold it after. But anyway, um, then I realized that they were actually flying back with me to Normans Arena and when I got in to fly to the site they were flying with me and uh -huh. things like that but it happens all the time it's not just the and not just intuitive with this um, I'm intuitive with all of them I didn't realize how much but I am anyway I don't usually talk about this so I'm surprised that you brought that up because I never told anyone else really except you must have picked up on it but you know, things like, you know, when I found the elephant bridge with my granddaughter, I mean, no, my daughter, Christine, we went, we were just happened to be at Harlow Sugar House, and um, Mr. Um, Harlow said, Annette, could you look for this Abenaki engine for me that were manufactured in Westminster Station? Yeah. It, was, it went off the ferry. Well, my granddaughter and I, the next day, we went to look for that. But and instead, we found the elephant bridge. Yes, right. I mean, but, but... There's many, many other things. Yes. It would take us days and weeks. And right, all. right, right, right. Yeah. Well, it story. might be worth writing about it. I mean, it's such a great story, and it's, it's so great, the connections that you've made. And, you know, I think one of the things is that um, you've done so much to inform our community geologically, historically, and also, I know, because you do from your heart. You know, I do. I love exploration, yeah. and I love, I think it inspires younger people that to get outdoors, don't just sit there reading about somebody else doing things. Yeah. You could be doing them. You could be exploring. You can be discovering. You could be a diver. You could be a kayaker. You could be an explorer on land. Mm -hmm. It's so important. There's so much to see and find. There is. Don't just read about it. Right. Do it. <laughs> Annette, thank you so much. You're so welcome. It's so inspiring to, to hear you and to, to imagine all of the things that you've seen. And as you said, you're more comfortable really in the water than in, on land. Is that right? Well, I feel very, very comfortable underwater for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, oh, during COVID for two years, I got to dive all the time because I don't think the fish carry COVID, although <laughs> they did discover they could see COVID in the water. But um, anyway, yes, I spent a lot of time. Yes. Hundreds of hours each year. Yes. So maybe that's why I became really comfortable underwater. <laughs> no, I'm really, really comfortable underwater for sure. Yeah. Thank you. I feel right at home there, just yeah. like putting your clothes on every morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Annette. Thanks to all of you for being with us today and to hear these great stories. And um, I uh, really encourage you to uh, check out more of Annette's videos and her presentations because she has seen so many things and explored so many different areas. So stay tuned, stay well, enjoy the summer, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.